Well, hello everyone, this is Mayor Ted Green thanking you all, those who are on Facebook, those who are on um, YouTube, uh, and those who are uh, planning to get on our telephone line. We're so uh, excited that you're joining us for our 15th uh, weekly meeting. Um, for the last 15 weeks, we have been bringing the citizens information on this COVID-19, this pandemic, and not only that, what some of the things that the state is saying and the county is saying and also information that's coming from the city. So those who are online, just give us a couple of minutes. We're gonna get right to you. We are excited about our panel tonight. We got Dr. Anise Thomas, who joined us again tonight for the second time. She was so interesting the first time when she talked about mental stress and anxiety, stress and mental health. So we're excited. We also excited to have a panel that really been sticking in with us for the last 15th week also. So again, hold on and we're going to start momentarily. Yep. Good evening. I just want to remind folks who are on the call so far, if you have a question, simply press zero and we'll be so that you can get your questions answered. Um, and it's for those who are on Facebook or YouTube, if you want to ask a question, the number is 862-213-3758. That's 862-213-3758. And again, to ask a question, just simply press zero and we're right on standby to get your questions answered. With that, sir, we have 938 people on the line and we should begin. Wow, thank you so much, Rachel. Again, good evening to everyone. Welcome to our, our weekly um, uh, meeting that we have been having, like I said earlier, for the last 15th week. Again, we are excited uh, with our panel tonight. Uh, we have, again, our Dr. Monique Griffin that's with us from our uh, uh, Director of Health and Human Services. We also have Victor Corte, our Public Health Officer, and we have Dr. Meta, who is with us from the East Orange General Hospital. And uh, we are really excited. But again, we have Dr. Anise Thomas from Director of Rutgers um, Counseling Center in North. Um, I'm just excited about this conversation. But let me very quickly before I start, we was um, we're going to be um, indulged tonight with, with my good friend, uh, Counselor Mustafa Brett was, was scheduled to join us. But unfortunately, he had um, a death in the family. And I know for a fact if he would have um, not had that death in his family. He would have been here with us. So I'm going to just ask everybody just for a couple of seconds. He was a very close friend to the family. Uh, the gentleman who passed was just like his a father to him. So I just want to send out our condolences to him and his family. And just for 30 seconds, just take a moment of silence. Thank you. Um, so with that, we're going to get started. Normally, because uh, we want to get into our conversation, I know that there's going to be a lot of calls, and I want to make sure our, uh, Dr. Anise get those calls coming in, because I know that during this COVID-19, um, uh, many of us, you know, uh, that went through this pandemic, something that was just not normal for uh, so many of us, uh, probably have experienced some stress, some anxiety, some, some mental breakdowns, and tonight is going to give all of you who are calling in, not only just for the information, but also get a chance to talk to Dr. Thomas about some of those issues. And she's going to be able to just give you some advice, uh, what, what needs to happen. So we're excited about that. But before that, I'm going to give you an update, and then I'm going to allow Dr. Griffin also to give an update. But we're going to really bounce around tonight. But I really want to dig into having these calls come in ratio of those individuals that really want to ask those questions about how they feeling and we want if so to the parents if you have kids out there and if you don't mind even if they feel like talking tonight and just really um, expressing themselves uh, we have dr thomas here, and i know she don't mind really just uh having our young people to know that probably what they're going through is a normal thing, but she's the teacher and she's the expert, so I'm gonna let her get into that. So let me let me just give you um, the quick numbers very quickly. As of Thursday, June the 25th, we have 2,139 positive cases here in the city of East Orange, 
and 210 confirmed deaths. Again, uh, first ward, 296 cases. Second ward, 349 cases. Third ward, 437 cases. Fourth ward, 443 cases. Fifth ward, 428 cases. In Essex County, there are 18,637 positive cases and 1,774 resulted in deaths. In New Jersey alone, um, we have 170,196 cases with 13,018 deaths resulted in those cases. So again, as we continue to uh, see our governor, which is now opening up the state uh, and, and, and asking everybody to still be vigilant, to still practice social distance, um, to make sure that you wear those masks. What's going to be a key, East Orange, and everybody that's listening, is that you're going to have to get used to wearing those masks. I know it's hard. I know it's warm outside, 90 degrees, 95 degrees. We're getting some warm weather. But what's going to control what we're doing with this virus, and Dr. Griffin and Dr. Matter can talk about it, and Victor, is that all of us have to stay steadfast because when those masses have proven that when it comes to this pandemic, that it's kind of dropping a little. But you look across different states, Florida and other states, that number is going back up because a lot of things that they didn't do, but we don't want to get back where we was at um, 14 weeks ago, okay? So with that, very quickly, uh, and we are getting to what the governor did a little later because I want to get into um, Dr. Um, Anise Thomas, but I'm going to ask Dr. Griffin to chime in right quick in terms of some of the numbers and some of the things that we're doing here in the city of East Storms and why it's important while other folks are opening up and we're taking our time and trying to do things very strategically that you have to make sure that you follow the rules and regulations and stay in compliance. So Dr. Griffin, just give him an overview. Sure. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Uh, as the mayor mentioned, there are still a number of positive cases that we are seeing reported here within the city. Uh, this week alone, there were an additional uh, 23 positive cases. It is still suggestive of the fact that our numbers of positive cases per week uh, are decreasing. But as the mayor said, it's so important for everybody to just remain diligent and make sure they're taking the necessary precautions because we don't want all of the hard work that was done over the past several weeks to be in vain. And as he also mentioned, a lot of states are reopening. We're reopening as well. But we want to be strategic about it so that we manage the number of positive cases and exposure here within the city. Uh, we've all worked hard. Uh, we have put together, and, and Mr. Cote, you can talk a little bit more about that later on, but we have put together a COVID-19 safe start plan. And I alluded to it last week, but what that entails is uh, the health department and public safety and code enforcement, our municipal offices providing support to businesses, barbershops, hair salons, nail salons that are interested in reopening by providing a checklist of what uh, we expect to find. And we want to make sure that the health and the safety of all of our residents is paramount and also maintained and that they implement practices to make sure that everybody remains safe. And so if you have questions about uh, any establishment that you visit, uh, and if you have concerns about either the number of people that are, are being maintained and invited indoors, or even the general health and safety practices, please feel free to contact the health department. You can also contact code enforcement, uh, but I will provide the health department's number, which is 973-266-5480. And, and thank you very much, Dr. Griffin, for that information. And, and we are going to come back uh, with even more of the things that all of us need to be doing. But I want to, I want to, I want to just jump into uh, just welcoming uh, Dr. Thomas. How you been, Dr. Thomas? I'm very well, thank you. Thank you for having me tonight. Well, we, we thank you for um, joining us again tonight. I, I don't know if you have an intro, but I do have some questions. But if you want to do an intro, you can do your intro. Then we have several questions. Then we're going to go right to our phone lines, because I know that so many people have some questions for you. Okay, well, well yeah, I mean, I'm happy. To, I'm, I'm glad that we have questions. I'm happy to do my best and, you know, address the concerns and questions that are 
um, folks are bringing to the table. I'll just say that, you know, um, I said it before when I was on here that we are in a health crisis and oftentimes um, it's easy to overlook the mental health impact of what's happening. And so I do appreciate the time that we are taking this evening to recognize that um, COVID-19 not only has a health impact, but it's also impacting our mental health. I think in general, most of us do well when we can kind of prepare for what's to come, when we have some idea of what to expect. But this, COVID-19 hit us in many ways that were just so unexpected, and we could not have imagined being on lockdown for such a long time. We had no idea that this was going to happen and how to prepare and just being disconnected from those that we love, um, for many folks being disconnected from income opportunities, not being able to provide for their families, um, all of that has taken a toll. And so I think that, you know, um, it would make sense that folks are feeling that outside of the physical impact, but really feeling the emotional burden, the stress, the anxiety that being in this lockdown, being in this global pandemic can cause. And so I'm really happy to be here today and hopefully offer some perspective and some guidance on what we can do to really move forward as a community. Wow. And, and thank you so much. So kind of my first question is, uh, typically it's easy to notice when someone needs help because of their behavior. But right now, everyone is like, again, we said it on edge, right? Um, is there any advice that you, from your experience that you can give people right now? And you kind of like uh, uh, touched on it through, you know, your opening. But what kind of advice and tips can you give a parent or even a child to recognize when someone needs help? Like, how can a person right now say to themselves, no, maybe I don't need help. Maybe I do need help. What do you recommend? So that's a great question. And I think, you know, Part of what you said in the beginning is really key. All of us are perhaps feeling a little bit off these days, right? Yeah, yeah. All of us might be feeling some level of stress and anxiety. And I just want to say, you know, stress in and of itself is not a bad thing, right? It helps us to kind of do what we need to do. And in a situation like this where, you know, I'm stressed out, right? And, I mean, we are... At, most of the people that I'm talking to are dealing with some level of stress. I think what we need to pay attention to um, as family members, as parents, is if the stress really impacts our functioning, right? And so if you are a high performer and, you know, you are outgoing and social and now that opportunity to be outgoing and social has been taken away from you and you are finding yourself laying in bed all day, that's not typical, right? So that's something that I would pay attention to. I think a lot of us are feeling a little on edge. I know as a parent, I've been feeling like my patience has been wearing thin as I was trying to manage work and homeschooling. And I think that, you know, I had to say, okay, is this you? Um, what do you need? I needed to take care of myself first in order for me to be even more available to my children. But I think we have to be looking at Number one, kind of normalizing some of the stress and agitation um, that we might be feeling. Figure out what is going to work for us and our family to manage some of those feelings of stress, but then also pay attention to how is this impacting my ability to function in the way that I want to function or that I know that I can function. And that's when, I mean, I think all of us can do things to, all of us can engage in healthy ways to manage our stress. And um, some of those things are just, number one, making sure that we're physically healthy, right? Like saying, it, like if we are experiencing symptoms of COVID, that we reach out to our providers to get clarification, to get the, the medical and health support that we need. But also, you know, thinking about who do I, who am I talking to? Who am I opening up to? What is weighing on my shoulders? Do I have a confidant? Um, take a break from all that is happening in the news. I mean, I think it's, finding a balance. We do need to know what, uh, we need to be able to access accurate information, appropriate information, but we also need to know when we are heading toward information overload and take a break from that. Um, exercise is always really important. Um, eating well is important for, for those of us with children. Try as best we can to put your children on some sort of schedule. Let them know what to expect day to day. Um, let them know how they can contribute to being 
in the house all the time. And so those are some things I think that we can all do. But if we're starting to notice that um, people are behaving in ways that are very different, let's say your child is crying all the time, having angry outbursts, or maybe even as adults, we're feeling more irritable and can't, we can't get a control of it. We, we don't know what to do with it. Um, and again, going back to I always look at functioning. Are you functioning in ways that are not like you? They don't feel consistent with who you are. That's when you may want to talk to somebody, yeah. um, call a helpline, find a doctor, and maybe get some extra help. Right, and, and I'm glad you kind of alluded to that because mental health um, always has been a stigma right, in the African-American community, in the black community, because sometimes we feel that uh, we need help, people gonna look, us, look at us in a different way, right? And other, and other ethnic groups also, but here in the African-American community, how can we as a community reinforce the, need, the needs of uh, getting help and, and, and say, you know, to our family members and to ourselves that it's okay? How we not be ashamed of seeking help? counseling or reaching out to somebody, you know, even to your minister or even to the email, how, how, how do we reinforce ourselves saying that that's a normal thing to do? Yeah, I mean, I think that's great. I think seeking support in faith-based communities is such a great way to at least begin to get some support. Um, you know, I, I think that Part of what we can do is this right now, create spaces where we are acknowledging that mental illness is real, um, mental health needs are real, and when we have these talking spaces like we are now, it, it kind of reiterates that message to the community, right? So we're not just talking about it, but we're being about it because we're creating this space for us to invite the community to talk about the stress that they're feeling in this current environment. The other thing that I've noticed um, working with young people is that I think young people are going to change the game. Um, you know, my my husband, my family, they're like, no, 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 we don't need, you know, we don't need to go talk to a psychologist. And I'm like, come on, like, we all could benefit from having a safe space to talk about our stuff, a safe space to be heard. And I'm seeing more and more in our in our younger communities that folks are willing to seek out. Support. In New Jersey, we have the New Jersey Association of Black Psychologists. Right. I think it's incredibly important to find, um, if you come from a community of color or even a faith-based community, you can find somebody um, from your community to talk to, and that might feel like a safe start. Um, I think especially in our current environment, so not only do we have this COVID-19 pandemic, but we are in this race-related pandemic, right? We yes. are... Many of us are experiencing racial trauma on top of the trauma associated from being in quarantine. And I don't think that we can disregard that, right? And so some of these same feelings that you were having in March and April are now being exacerbated because of what's happening in our nation with, with respect to race relations. And so I think it's even more so important to find, you know, um, clinicians of color that can understand that experience and create a space to talk about those experiences. Right, right, and I, and I agree with that. You know, one, one thing, uh, you know, being the mayor, and uh, you, you, we quite often get a lot of calls, right? Uh, and people are, are stressing for many things. They're stressing from uh, what's happening with my job, right? They're stressing from if they was a, 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 a victim of having COVID, but they didn't get to get them to their family. Uh, what, what is my reaction when I get back home? I'm afraid to, if, if I do this or do that, uh, I don't want my family to get affected. Uh, I, I'm going to keep my kids home. I'm going to keep uh, away from this. So that anxiety alone, and, and that would have kind of brought us into the same way of, of my good friend, Councilman Mustafa Brett, who he went through the ordeal. And there's people that went through the ordeal of having COVID. What is your suggestion uh, for those people who have those have, have, have that anxiety and, 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 and feel in some kind of way that some, some people may feel, you know what, I, I, I feel my family because I wind up being somewhere and, and I got COVID or who, how do I know who came in my house? And I, so there's a lot of kind of uncertainties out of there, out, out, outside of all of us, you know. How do you feel folks should, should deal with that when it comes to having it or think they should have, you know, 
Yeah. I think, you know, um, anxiety and stress often come from when, from the fear of the unknown, right? We don't know what's going to happen, and we create all of these scenarios that can be very scary, and it prevents us from going forward and going out there into the world. I think in our current climate, we need a little bit of anxiety. We need a little bit of that stress. And I think what is going to help is what, Mayor, you we talked about in your introduction is that thank God that New Jersey is doing the right thing to mitigate risk, right? And the reason, and the way that I think about it now is that, you know what, we've done so much of the hard work, March, April, May, June, we don't want to stop, and we're going to continue to do that, and we're going to follow the guidance from local and state departments of health. We are going to continue to make really good decisions, and I think that it's completely fair for folks to be worried about going back to work. Um, and they are worried about keeping themselves safe and their families safe, and I think that when those fears come up, we have to talk about them. I think part of what's going to help to mitigate some of that anxiety is talk to your employer about, okay, what are the plans being in place? I love Dr. Griffith said that, you know, the, the municipal um, offices are available to provide guidance to all of our businesses. That's what we all, be, we all need to do. And I think that we're seeing the evidence of doing the right thing in this environment because we're seeing the reduction in numbers statewide, right? And I think that um, we have... Um, leadership, you, you yourself included, our governor, that are really paying close attention to the numbers. And if we start to see the numbers go the wrong way, I do have faith that we're going to make decisions about um, maybe changing the way that we're moving forward and being very careful and very cautious based on the data, based on science, um, and we don't want to put our community members at risk. So I think, you know, number one is, is paying attention to how the state is managing this crisis already, but I think number two is we need to really think about what are the practices that we can put into place, right? I mean, I'm sure Dr. Mehta can talk about this, but something as simple as more, we are washing our hands more than ever before, right? We are not touching our face more than ever before. Um, when we go back to work, we are going to make sure that our spaces are clean, that we are practicing social distancing, we're going to continue to wear masks, um, and those are the things that we can best do to make sure that we're keeping ourselves, um, our coworkers, and our family right. safe. Right. Right. Fact, I would just add, we should ask the questions. You know, if you have a concern about something, we have to, we have to be assertive. We have to use our voice. We have to ask questions. Right. So with that, hey, Rachel, uh, can, can we get some calls on? Because, you know, I'm excited about this conversation. I want to see who's out there, have a question for the panel tonight, but more so for Dr. Anise Thomas. Uh, can you bring some calls in for us? So, sure, um, you know, most of our questions are, are, are about some of the stuff that we've talked about over the last few weeks. Okay, um, and all right. Issues. Do we have anybody out there want to ask Dr. Um, Thomas um, some questions? Um, not as of yet. Most of our stuff are all right. more... Yep. Yeah. All right. So, so we can bring some of those. I'll start with what we have from um, Facebook. We have a question from Facebook. Okay. From Mary Williams. Right. And she asked, um, are the police controlling to stop some of the fireworks? Um, I know we had that question last time, too. As well. Yeah, yeah. And we so, also got a little fireworks question that popped up. Right. So very quickly, and bear with us at the times we've been having. So, you know, um, the fireworks, we are, we, we, we set up a task force here in the city of Beach Orange, and those who think that they can just um, all through the day, all through the night, all through the midnight, uh, set these firecrackers off. You know, be honest with you, it's very immature um, to me, for those who are doing it. But I just want to kind of just say this, right? We just went um, on a 14-week on a pandemic uh, with this COVID. Then we had another full couple weeks with this racism and this profiling and this, and this police brutality. And I would have thought that, to me, that when we pulled together for 14 weeks and had to be home, had to be in the house, had to uh, go shopping at a certain time, uh, and we was practicing social distance, and we was practicing um, wearing face masks, that all of us somehow, um, as adults and as young people, could have taken this whole situation totally different, that these fireworks have disrupted 
individual's life. 1.30 in the morning, you're shooting off um, uh, what they call M80s and firecrackers. But I thought, you know, and I say to my community, to be honest, we're better than that. You know, basically what I think that is happening, and I have to say this with this fireworks, I think that when folks outside our community saw all of us come together, and we marched together, we protest together, and we didn't do anything to destroy our community, right? Now here they are bringing these firecrackers from all over into our community where our, where, our, where our police department has to come in and interact with our community. And I do believe that there's some madness behind these folks bringing in these, uh, these fireworks to disrupt our community and have our community angry again with our local police department. That's just my own theory, and that's what I feel, that they, they do not want to see us again, how we came together for 14 weeks. But we do have a task force, and if anybody uh, is having problems during the day and night and they need to call our police department, I have a number here. Let me get that number, because we have a confidential number you can call. And when you do call, you do not have to give your name. Just got to give the East Orange Police Department your uh, telephone number. I mean, the, the location of where they're shooting the fireworks at 973-266-500. But we are on top of it, and there's a zero tolerance here in the city of Beach Storage. Uh, Rachel, do we have any more? Right quick. This person dropped off the line, but I read their question. And the question was from Toby. And she, Toby says that she thought it would be a good idea to use one of these meetings to allow COVID survivors to talk about their experience and share their story. Right, and so I know, thank you, Sister you. Corbett. Um, Sister Corbett, I got your email. That's why we was bringing Mustafa, Council Member Mustafa Brett here tonight to talk about his experience. I hear you loud and clear, and we're definitely gonna make sure that we have a conversation about those who um, who, who, who survived um, COVID, the COVID, and have a conversation about how you feel. And that's why, really, um, Dr. Anissa is here tonight um, to even talk to those who had it or who somehow have a phobia about it so we can kind of bring some relief to all of us because all of us is probably going through the same thing in terms of anxiety about this COVID piece. So I hear you loud and clear, uh, Ms. Corbett. I got your email. Any, so any? I got another question from Facebook from Sasha Lynn for Dr. Thomas. Any advice on how to transition going back to work into... Um, the fourth after being quarantined for so long, like how many people are prepared mentally and emotionally to return? And how do you prepare? That's a great, great question. Um, and, you know, I think part of that is going to be based on where you work, right? So some, some places of business are bringing folks in, um, in, in, in phases, in scattered ways, every other day, um, changing up of the hours. So I think that there, I think in that in and of itself, I think that there's some opportunity to kind of phase yourself back to work. I think part of what um, we can do, because recognizing that folks are working in various um, places of business, um, something that we can do is get back onto the schedule that works for you. You know, I, for example, um, when I was having to commute into work, I was up at 5.30 every morning and I had like a very clear routine. Um, and then I found several weeks into the quarantine, I was like sleeping late, I could, my sleep was disrupted, I was waking at inconsistent times. Um, and I've actually recently said to myself, you know what, I need to get back onto a schedule that works for me. So I think that that's something that we can do early on. Find the schedule that you know works for you when you're back to life as usual, if you will. Um, and even if you are not getting ready to go, for, go back to work right away, if you know it's going to be happening in a few weeks, get back to that schedule. Because I think that if we wait until the last minute to... Um, get back onto a schedule that's going to work for us, it's going to be much more difficult at that point. Right, and, 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 and that is true. So, you know, this year alone has been very um, challenging for our young people, right? Um, especially from grade school all the way up to high school. Uh, and first time in my lifetime that um, I saw where our young people had to literally 
um, switch from being in school and being home, right, and doing homework and doing their assignments online, but also the experience that they didn't have an opportunity to go to their prom, they didn't have an opportunity to graduate and walk across that stage. And, and I quite often, you know, and not only as a mayor, but also as a father, kind of think about, you know, how, how, how young people are feeling. So from, from your experience, Dr. Uh, Thomas, how, how do you think our young people, you know, and it's just from your experience, should be dealing, and, and parents, because, you know, fa parents felt bad. I felt bad. You know, we try to do everything we can through the city to accommodate our young people by doing a caravan through the city and blowing the horn and just give them some uplift and enthusiasm. What, what, is your, what is your take on how our young people should be dealing with that situation? Um, so I think it, it, you know, we're seeing a mix of emotions. You know, there's some like really young children that are like, ah, we're home, home. I'm home with my mom and dad, I'm happy. Um, I think it's harder when you get into older children and the teenagers that are so, um, that they thrive with social interaction and they need to see their friends. And um, I think that it's been really hard for some of our older children. Um, in terms of celebrating, um, especially the graduates, the, the proms, these sort of milestone events, graduating, whether you're graduating from fifth grade and going into middle school for the first time or you graduated high school and getting ready to go to college, I think that um, the caravans, those, those um, honking in the street, um, thinking about really being creative, thinking about ways to honor and uplift our children, especially during a time like this is critically important. Um, and I think that it's just up to our communities to really be creative. Um, I know that in some, in some communities, teachers were dropping off presents, leaving things in mailboxes for their students. Parents were doing that for other children. I think, and it doesn't even have to be anything big, but I think there's ways that we can kind of instill a, infuse a little joy right, into, right. The, of our, into the day or the week of a child by doing these really simple things. Um, you know, and I know that a lot of folks have been doing the caravans and beeping. I know in our district they, um, they lit lanterns at a certain time across the town for some of the graduates, and I think there's, there's lots of ways to celebrate. And, you know, now that the end of the school year has happened, there's still so many other celebrations. There's birthdays. There's um, anniversaries. And I think that, you know, this is – we'll remember them because this is – such a unique environment we're in, but I think that it's really, we are obligated to celebrate them because this is still life, and I think part of what helps with our mental health is having a sense of hopefulness, having a sense of joy, and so whenever and however we can celebrate, we need to really try to do that. Right, and I, and I, and I, and I, and I thank you for that because that's one of, and, you know, and, and very quickly, I'm going to ask Rachel, Rachel, do we got any calls? We do. Um, so I have a, a, quest, a, a question from the study about making sure that the children in the park on Dodge Street are safe because they're playing in the park without math. And she wants to know what can, what can we do? Well, I'll leave that to Dr. Griffin. You know, I mean, we've been stressing that for, uh, from the time that folks had to put on uh, masks. I know for a fact we've been having signs all around the park. That's a county park where we're working together, but I'm gonna let Dr. Griffin, you know, elaborate on that. Huh, okay. One of y'all, come on, guys. Right. About the masses in the park. Kids are in the park with no masks. How important is it for them to have the masses? Uh, good evening, Mr. Range. Uh, it's very important that our children use their mask. Um, we should not be deceived by previous information or data that says that kids are exempt or not very, very affected by COVID. We've been seeing more children and teens now being affected by COVID even after the mass demonstrations in various states. So please um, ensure that your children as they go to the park, that they have, uh, they keep social distancing as well and they use their face mask. It's very, very important um, we can't stress this enough. Please, it's very important. We don't want all the effort that we have put into this 
for the past three months to just be in vain. Right. And we don't want to have to mourn over any child in this city. Right. Thank you. Right. So, so I, I helped off the um, uh, Victor. He can't say it no better. I, you know, we, we've been doing everything we can. We need the parents. We need the community, our police officers. Again, we know how hard it is for young people to want to play and, and cover their mouth. It's just not a normal thing, but um, we the village. It takes the village. You see a young person, uh, you know, get out and just say, hey, young man, put your mask on, you know, if they plan, and just remind them. That's all we can do. We're doing everything we can. But again, it takes all of us to remind each and every person in this city to put on your mask because it's only going to help safeguard all of us and the community. So we're doing everything we can to the caller who asked that question. And we're going to continue to push, 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 and push and make sure people wear those masks. It's important. Do you have any more, Rachel? Okay. Yeah, I'm going to bring Ms. Jackson in and her question is more about like how are we handling the reopening and salon. Ms. Jackson? <clears throat> Hello, Ms. Jackson. Hello, yes, I'm here. I was just wondering, I went to the hairdressers and I didn't know, they, uh, and they were very upset about me going to the hairdressers, but I noticed that it wasn't clean like it should have been. And then the nail salon that I was going to on Central Avenue was the same way. I was wondering who was checking on them, sanitizing everything, right. instruments and everything. And I went because my hair was so bad, I took the chance, masks, gloves, everything, you know. But I think somebody in the health department should be checking on these things because these hairdressers are opening up, the floors aren't clean and everything. I mean, it's just like the normal thing that you normally go through because i really been going into Marshtown to get things done. And uh, so I started coming down here to East Orange and everything. But they really need to check on these hairdressers and right. what, nail salons Jackson, and everything. What, what address sure is that? They're sanitizing their equipment. Right. Ms. Jackson, do you have the address of that uh, establishment? Uh, I... You don't have to I say it online. What, 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 what you can do, uh, okay, uh, I'm going to ask Rachel online. to take your number, and I'll call you back personally. Don't you call you, me back? Okay. Yes, I'll do that. And, okay. and Jackson, what, what, what you can do? And what? And, what? <laughs> and, and, and uh, yes. yes. The other thing that you can do is when we click over, um, mm -hmm. just press zero again and leave it on the recording so we can get it for you from you. Okay. And I, you know, it might be more, you know, that's like that. Well, we'll be out there tomorrow, Ms. Jackson. We'll be out there tomorrow. Uh, okay. Thank you. And, it, and if you heard earlier, that's why um, um, Dr. Griffin, um, our Director of Health and Human Services, along with our health, of, that's why we're doing things very gradually. What folks are doing, because they're hearing the governor say this can open, that can open, that can open these establishments. But we are taking our time because the situation is just like what you said. Absolutely, and Mayor, if I may. Mm -hmm. Also, to answer uh, the question about what we are doing, that is where the city does come into play. The health department, in addition to code enforcement and public safety, have released a priority checklist. And while the health department, uh, Mr. Cote, inspectors do canvas the entire city and evaluate whether or not businesses have adequately prepared to uh, protect the health, the health and the well-being of customers, we're able to gauge that. So we are canvassing. If you do come across, if you or anybody else really within the city come across any uh, establishments that you do not believe are adhering to the health, the general health and safety standards, or you feel as though your health is being compromised in any way, and they're not adequately protecting you, please definitely give us a call. Because it's been very clear that the establishments uh, should be limiting uh, themselves to appointments only. Uh, we want to minimize the number of walk-ins that are going into establishments so we can control the number of people that are in the facilities. The governor has spoken about the fact that the, uh, the facilities should really be uh, maintaining 25% 
of their maximum capacity. So it's going to be limited. You shouldn't be in an establishment with a lot of individuals. We've also spoken about uh, the recommendation for contactless payment methods. We've also spoke, spoken about the use of gloves, the use of masks for and within those establishments, including hair salons, including nail salons, and barbershops. So if you're seeing that that's not being done, please definitely let us know, and we'll follow up. Great, so I have a few of the same questions. Um, and this is, goes back to last week. You gave out a number for people who couldn't get in touch with unemployment mayor. Could yeah. you please give that number out? And I'm also getting, what number do people call about the fireworks complaint? Um, let me get let me get that number very quickly. Just hold up. So for we have we have uh, we have a, a website myunemployment.nj.gov, and we also have a telephone number NJ Unemployment 201-601-4100. I'm gonna say that number again. 201-601-4100. And that's the unemployment number. And the website is myunemployment.newjersey.gov. Also, if you having problems, please call our um, Congressman, Congressman um, Donald Payne Jr. I was just on the phone with him earlier, and an individual called that was having a problem, and his office helped. So again, you can go online under um, Congressman Donald Payne Jr. and get that contact number. And I apologize that I don't have it in front of me, but if you call my office at 973-266-5151, we'll make sure you get that number. You can ask for Justin Brown or Ija Baldwin, okay? Yep, and then what number do people call to complain about fireworks? Fireworks. We have, we, have our, we have a number here. This is our hotline. This is our hotline number. 973-266-5151. Um, Five four zero one nine seven three two six six five four zero one. And you know, um, Mayor, I just pulled up the Congressman's Newark office. Yes. And so for that, we're going to get help with unemployment. It's nine seven three six four five three two one three. We have any more calls? So I'm going to bring, I sure do. So I'm going to bring someone in. Um, I'm going to bring in Mr. James Williams. And he's a question about voting. Mr. Williams? Hi, Mr. Williams. Okay, well, his original question was, are we able to go to the regular polling site? Right. Well, see this ballot. If you receive this ballot, it's important for them to get it back into the mail. But you are going to be able to go to the regular voting sites. Matter of fact, I just post where the voting sites would be here in the city of East Orange. But again, even when you go to the, the regular voting sites, you're still going to um, vote by you know ballot. So you still can go. But if you receive your ballot, uh, if you go in front of City Hall, we have a a box there you drop your ballot in that box they pick that the ballots up daily um so again he has an option yes he's going to be able to go to one of the voting um sites and, and cast his um, vote okay great and i just want to say already in essex county you know over thirty-one thousand people have already voted wow and it's super important that we stand up and be counted yes yes it's um, important Great. So I have another question here, um, and this is a question about uh, the supermarkets and, and, and pricing. Hello? Hello? Hi. You want to give me your name? My name is Lucinda Hughes. Hi, Ms. Lewis. How are you What's doing? Why Tropical Supermarket? Cheaper the price and things that little people have to buy to eat. And this has been going on for 
Even though the mayor talks to them about it, it's still going on. A pack of codfish for two dollar fifty is now three dollar fifty. Mm. Yes. Thank you, Matthew. Thank you. Thank you so much. What what we would do um, is. Uh, but can you get somebody out there tomorrow? We, we have our health officer send somebody out there tomorrow. Um, and, you know, we, we had a long talk early um, in, in phase one of this COVID-19 where we talked about price um, gouging, where folks was pushing up the prices uh, within their stores. You know, we, you know, I mean, they have a right to jack the prices, but you don't oververt in the community or the people in the community because again, that brings stress on people. So again, uh, we're not tolerating folks who are over saturating these prices in these stores, knowing that people are going through this pandemic. We're not trying to make no excuse, but we're trying to say, you gotta help also. Because if the folks don't come to your store, you won't have business. So again, we will have somebody out there tomorrow and seeing if the prices are compatible uh, to what they're supposed to be and hopefully that we can bring some uh, closure to the problem that the lady that just called um, had. Thank you. Yes. Okay, I'm going to bring a I'm going to bring Zanoli, and I hope I'm saying your name correctly. They have a question about what kind of mask people should wear when they have different illnesses like asthma. Oh, Doctor So, uh, any regular mask should be okay if you're not uh, taking, if you're not in a serious condition of advanced COPD or advanced asthma, you can wear a regular mask, a surgical mask, a cloth mask, they are fine. If you do have advanced COPD, advanced heart failure, advanced asthma, you should talk to your lung doctor or your heart specialist and they will be able to guide you specifically on those conditions. But for the most part and most of us, even in healthcare, are used to wearing masks for 12, 15 hours, and it's fine. It does not cause any long-term or short-term health side effects. Thank you, thank you. So, so and thank also, you. let me, Rachel, just before you go on and give us another call, I, 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 I want to ask Dr. Um, Anise Thomas a question, right, Dr. Thomas. So another, uh, another thing that, uh, Dr. Thomas, we went from being normal uh, individuals and and in September and October and November, where we just wore normal clothes. You know, our, our parents always told us, wash your hands before you come in the house, take the shoes off. But then we went from as uh, adults to seniors to young people down to our toddlers, but we had to adjust to wearing masks. What do you think the psychological effects on individuals who have to adjust really that quick on a life that we probably never had to experience. And, and I just want to kind of add this to it. And think about it, many of us watch other countries and we used to wonder, why are these folks wearing masks, right? And here, here we go in the U.S. Now we have to wear masks. I think, you know, I, I don't, I haven't read any of the data um, because we're learning so much now, but what I will, what I can, I can make sort of an educated guess that for some of our younger people, this is now going to be normalized, right? That we are um, washing your hands, wearing a mask, we're doing it to protect ourselves. It's not scary, it's not creepy, um, it doesn't mean that, you know, it's not stigmatizing, it's become, it's become sort of normal at this point, right? And so I think that in many ways, um, my, and again, this is, we still need to kind of, we still need to see the, the data that comes out of this epidemic, and we're going to learn from it, and we're going to do better. Um, but my thought is, as we are now educating our young people, I think our young people will have the opportunity to practice more caution. And I mean, I think that even goes back to the caller that talked about the park, right? Like, like it's the parents that need to educate our children. Like this is this is what we're doing to keep our community safe. I think when we do that, when we say we're wearing masks to keep our safe, that actually is going to help bring the anxiety down for young people. Um, and for the older folks, we have to also understand we're you know we're asking all of the our health professionals are telling us to do these things to keep us alive, to keep us safe. Um, so I think that there's going to be more to come. 
on what are the full implications of this, the last six months has been on the lives of our, our community members. Right, and, I, and, and, and just very, go ahead, Dr. Matter. No, I, I just wanted to add one more thing. I think uh, there is going to be a component of, uh, like Dr. Thomas said, about kids. Uh, as they go in for the next year of school and then fall comes in, and it, this may still be an issue where parents would not want their kids to either mingle with other kids or wear a mask at all times. And I think that's going to be the part of normal behavior going forward. But interestingly, what I've seen started seeing is people are starting to express their personality with these masks. And you know, you've got masks in different color, different styles, different bling. Uh, Victor here is wearing a mask saying that stay six feet away from me. <laughs> so, you know, it's going to start being an expression of your personality. And I think that is one way where people will start adopting to it. Uh, I think that's going to be the way the adults are going to be uh, adopting to the new normal state. And I guess that's the way we are evolving. But you're absolutely right. People used to look at and say, like, why are people in other countries wearing masks all the time? Pollution, but now they're doing it for COVID. Yeah, that's so. true. I, I saw a young lady. She had a mask on and said, she said, um, I don't feel like talking right now. So I joked with her, I said, well, I'm gonna wear a, a mask tomorrow to say, okay, you know? So, you know, but you know, I just, you know, it, like I say, we went from one stage of just being a normal uh, life and here we are and, and wearing the face of mask. Um, and, I, and, and I know that it, it has been, you know, hard on, on so many other people. I do wanna ask you uh, also, uh, you know, during this COVID, um, our community, you know, and I'm speaking about East Orange and I know other communities, but, you know, um, we lost a lot of people here. You know, we lost uh, parents, grandparents, friends, and uh, acquaintances. Uh, uh, you know, I lost my mom on March the 8th, you know. Um, and just, just from your opinion, um, you know, I quite often think as the mayor, sometimes I sit home, and wondered, did I do everything uh, we, as a team, because this was such a team effort, and I, and I can't stop talking about it. Did we do everything we have, uh, could have, and needed to do in the community? Um, so my question is, how do you think uh, people should react and people, how they feel in terms of, they don't have to get up the next day and continue to live their lives? I think, um I think that's a great question. I, you know, we, we talk about grieving, we talk about bereavement and, and grieving after loss. And I think that for anybody that has lost anyone since we've been on lockdown, I think I automatically think about that as complicated grief because we, we don't get to do and engage in the same rituals and activities that we do to give us a sense of closure, to give us a sense of goodbye. I think losing somebody, no matter what, if losing a loved one is hard no matter what, but when you're in an environment where you you can't say goodbye, you can't go to the hospital, you can't have a funeral, um, you can't you can't have a repast, you can't you know in many communities we we celebrate the person's life and we do that in 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 ways where we come together and we we love on each other, we support each other, we hug on each other, and we can't do that in this current environment. And I think it's. You know, I think that that's a, a greater loss and it complicates the grieving process. Um, and I think that, you know, we still have to find ways to, to honor and celebrate the life of the loved ones, um, whether it's, you know, lighting a candle or getting together for a virtual ceremony. And I think what you're talking about really is, leads to a bigger issue that for many of us, this time has been traumatic. Some people have been managing fine, but for many of us, this has been a traumatic time. And, you know, you talked about, hey, October, November, we were walking around normal. And then all of a sudden, we were hit with this pandemic, and that is traumatic. And I think that I would really urge all of us as a community, this is not just about jumping into life back to normal again when we can, right? I think that it's taking a moment to be kind to yourself, process what has happened, Talk to your loved ones about what has happened. Yes. Don't, don't keep it to yourself. Don't let it sit on your shoulders. Um, we can't just move forward as if this, this, this didn't happen because it did happen. And many people are still grieving and many people are still hurting. And we need to understand how to take care of their trauma 
that we're all, we've all experienced in some ways. Yes, thank you. So for I that. just want to give you all a quick time check. Yes, today Rachel. We have a really important question from Facebook for both Dr. Thomas and Dr. Griffin, so I'd like to read it. Yes. So this is from Rosemary, um, and she says many private therapists are not taking new clients or do not accept certain insurances. Are there any group sessions available to individuals in our town or maybe even virtual sessions? So I can't, I know I can't speak to the town, but I know that I have seen and I, um, I have seen many um, community mental health organizations, um, even different apps that are offering like free groups, free virtual meetings, um, maybe, and, and not even um, therapeutic groups, but even just free support groups for folks that are wanting to come together and talk. Um, I'm not sure what we're offering specifically in the town, but I definitely think that um, there are ways to access support, even if it's not traditionally by going to sit with a with a psychologist. I also say that I think many psychologists didn't really know what to do when we moved quickly into this environment, but now um, most clinicians and most um, mental health agencies are equipped to do virtual services. And so, yeah, we just need to kind of find out who's doing, who's offering virtual groups, virtual individual therapy, um, and really working with the insurance companies and pushing them to, to open up their list of providers. Right. Yes, and also in addition, locally, we have entities like East Orange General, we have Newark Communities Health Center, uh, those facilities, as well as some other nonprofit health programs do offer resources, and even now, uh, as Dr. Thomas mentioned, are better equipped to provide support virtually, uh, but also given that the community is starting to reopen, you'll see opportunities also uh, increase for in-person sessions again. And at East Orange General Hospital, we are providing virtual uh, telehealth visits as well as uh, group therapy sessions. Uh, it is hard to do a group session on a Zoom meeting. It's not the same uh, as Dr. Thomas can uh, probably agree with, uh, but uh, at least the individual sessions are going very well. You can go on to eogh.org and it has all the details with regards to making a appointment with our behavioral health specialists. We have both certified physicians and psychiatrists and therapists as well who can take care of you. And, and Dr. Um, Thomas, can you provide um, some some telephone numbers for uh, 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 folks in the community? Is there any apps out there, hotlines that can help the people in our community? Can you provide some numbers? So I think if you call in New Jersey, if you call 211, Dr. Griffin, correct me if I'm wrong, but you can access several community mental health agencies. They will give you tons of information about resources. Um, and then if there's also, you know, if you're in crisis, we have, we, we um, have the National Lifeline, and that is 1-800-273-TALK is the phone number where folks can access um, just like immediate crisis support. But I think if you call 211, you'll have access to several resources in the community. Yes, and what we'll do Thank is you. Well, we'll have the two-minute mark, Mayor. We'll also share okay. information as well. Right. Uh, uh, Dr. Anise Thomas, thank you so much. We had a two-minute mark, and uh, we thank you so much for joining us again, and I hope this um, don't be your last time. Uh, but again, we thank you so much for uh, so much uh, information, but more so just uh, those folks who are watching on Facebook, those folks who called in, and even some of us sitting here. You gave us some, uh, some, some, some relief to know that during this whole pandemic and some of the things that we are going through in life that, you know what, we're normal people. And that um, having some time uncertainties and having some time being a little stressed and thinking that, um, Sometimes things are closing in on you, that we're just human beings. So we, I, I thank you so much for really sharing that. And I know that the people um, watching and enjoying it, and they appreciate it too. And, and to everyone who's been with us for the last 15 weeks, uh, you know, from day one, um, this city came together. We locked arms together, and uh, we put together these meetings. We put together 
uh, uh, had to share information, working together with the county and the state, but more so here in the city of East Storms, I kind of used the analogy of, of, of saying that we are on this track together and when it's all over, that we're going to come through the finish line together. We're not over the finish line, but I can tell you that we have proved to people here in the city of East Storms that we're one. And we did that for 15 weeks. And we want the people out there to know that we appreciate all of you. We appreciate all the, uh, uh, all the employees and all the uh, doctors and nurses and, 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 and everyone, really. You know, and my staff who has been doing an outstanding job. But what I do ask of all of you uh, that don't allow ourselves to get complacent, don't allow ourselves to go backwards. You know, we, we're starting to hear that there's other cities and other towns who are getting this surge again. We don't want to be uh, at that stage again. We want to kind of climb over this rope and be where we at, where we can be comfortable again in our city. But again, uh, stay precautious um, to, we have to, you know, folks tell us that we don't have to do what we have to, that we've been doing. So I thank everybody for joining us, but I, I wish everybody well. We're going to have to come back next week again because we're still working on our plan of how we're going to open up East Orange. But we do ask everyone to have patience with, with, with our Health and Human Service Office, Dr. Griffin and uh, Victor Cote, in terms of how we open up. Because when we open up, we want to make sure that we did everything we can in the city to make sure that we safeguard all of you. So with that, uh, may God continue to bless all of you. May God continue to bless your families. May God continue to bless East Orange. And we're so grateful for our panel tonight. Dr. Uh, Matter, thank you. Um, Vic, thank you. And Dr. Griffin, thank you. And Dr. Thomas, you are the best. We thank you so much.